Good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of Christ, and I greet you on behalf of Watula United Methodist Church, where I'm the pastor. My name is Keith Badowski, and our message for today is called God Speaks, Job Shakes. I'll be uh, sharing a scripture with you in a moment from Job uh, chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. Again, chapter 38, 1 through 7, if you want to get there in your Bibles. Let us start with a word of prayer first this morning. Let us pray. Lord, you know how many times I thought I knew how to run my life, how to fix their problems, and how you should answer my prayers. But each time through trauma or tragedy, hardship or hard times, you remind me how much I don't know about your will. Though I may not like it at the time, please remind me that you are God and I am not. Ask me questions I can't answer. Give me answers I can't comprehend. Remind me that you laid the earth's foundation, that you speak and the winds obey, that you squeeze the clouds till rain falls. Then give me the good sense to hold my peace and meditate upon what you've just said. Amen and amen. Hear this, the reading of God's Word. This is the authoritative, inerrant, holy Word of God from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. And uh, uh, this is God speaking out of the whirlwind to Job. So uh, please bear with me as I give this a, a booming God-like voice when I read God's dialogue. So here's uh, 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? And who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? This is the reading of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I read that with a booming voice because that is the voice of God speaking out of the whirlwind. And it certainly was a shock to Job to hear that. And sometimes I wonder if maybe I come to church with too casual an attitude about God. I wonder if sometimes I come to church not expecting very much to happen not expecting God to do very much. Uh, maybe at best I come expecting to be comforted or to uh, hear some kind of wise counsel or maybe get some advice about uh, where I'm going wrong in my life. But other times it's just routine and I don't expect much of anything. And so uh, going to church can become a bit of a exercise in boredom. And I don't know where you are in that this morning. I don't know if you came with expectation and um, a sense of awe, or if you came out of humdrum routine. In whatever case, I hope the Lord has something for you this morning. Um, I'm just making an observation here, though, that in general, our culture and our time has too casual an attitude about God. You can hear it in the language all around us. People uh, use God's name and, and Christ's name as expletives. 
you know, they say OMG. You know what those initials stand for. I don't need to say it. Or they say GD. Again, you know what those initials stand for. We hear it all the time. It's just part of our natural language. And we may even say these things ourselves without thinking much about it. But it's a casual way of dealing with God's name. It's almost a sign that we're not paying much attention to who we're referring to. In some ways, there, there are reasons why in our culture we might think of God as kind of this cuddly grandfather in the sky that we don't have to worry too much about. And I think maybe that comes partially from when Jesus walked the earth. Uh, he taught us about God in a way that was gentle, that we could call upon him as children talking to their father. And he told us parables that helped us to picture God as a kind shepherd taking care of his sheep or a loving father uh, who's been longing for the return of his son. And when he sees him at the horizon, he runs towards him, arms outstretched. These are all very comforting images, kind images. But we just might go too far with it and think that God's just this gentle old man who's um, doing nothing up there but, but shedding love upon us. Um, Job doesn't have that understanding of God. And maybe that should give us something new to think about. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but most scholars think that the book of Job may be the oldest piece of writing in the Bible at all. And so when the Jews preserved this book, they did so because they saw something in it about how God was characterized, how human beings were characterized, and what the relationship is between God and human beings. So, you know, make no mistake, this is the inspired word of God, and it tells us something about who God is. And Job clearly understood that encountering God was a fearsome thing that it was sort of like playing with dynamite, or maybe it's like playing with dynamite about around a big bonfire. It's just waiting for things to explode. Um, we kind of hear this in Job 9, uh, Job chapter 9, verses 32 through 35, where Job is, is wishing he had a mediator. You know, he's using this language of the courtroom, and he's saying, I want to talk to God in a court uh, context, to defend myself, defend myself against, you know, before this great judge. But I wish I had a mediator. I wish I had a, a counselor who could go between me and God and, and give an extra layer of protection. Um, because going directly to God, that's a fearsome thing. Uh, we hear these words in Job 9, verse 33. He says, Job says, if only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more, then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. And that's because Job has a healthy fear of coming before God. He knows he's talking about having a conversation with his creator, the one who made everything. Now, in our time, we don't have quite this problem because we have a mediator. Jesus came. He is the mediator between us and the Father. And because of that, we have a much more relaxed relationship with God. But I just want to be cautious here uh, we can't relax too much that we take God for granted and that we treat him casually. I think it's important that we have a healthy fear of the Lord, the one who gave us life and who created the universe. Now, when God does speak to Job, he helps Job get a proper perspective on who God is and what God's perspective is on everything. Uh, it sort of reminds me of The Wizard of Oz. You know, I'm thinking of that scene where 
Dorothy and her companions come into the Emerald Palace and they're each looking for something to uh, receive from Oz, the great and powerful. And we hear this booming voice in the movie. Who are you? Why have you come? And their teeth rattle and they're shaking in their boots. Uh, this is really um, Job's experience of hearing God's voice out of the whirlwind. You know, God is, has this teeth rattling voice that says, who dares question me? And if you dare question me, I'll make sure that you actually hear what I have to say. And then maybe I'll listen to what you have to say. So God asks questions of Job. And these questions have the effect of reminding Job and us that God created everything. He gave us life itself and he created every form of life on the planet. He created our world, our atmosphere. Uh, he has dominion over weather. Um, he has dominion over all the creatures on the world. And he is fully aware, intensely aware, of everything that's happening at every moment. That's the impression you get from the series of, of questions God asks. Nothing escapes his notice. He knows about the animals who are grazing on the grass. He knows about the birds of prey who are eating uh, the, the uh, animals that are killed. He knows everything, and nothing escapes his notice. It's sort of like, it reminds me anyway, of young children who are just so fascinated by everything they see. Everything is amazing and intense. Well, that's God's point of view. He is fully aware and intensely involved in everything that he's created. Everything is interesting, and he wants Job to notice how everything that exists speaks of God's power and should remind us of his awesomeness, and it should create in us a sense of awe. You know, as adults, uh, sometimes we just get complacent, and we really need um, sometimes to be jolted to attention to be reminded how powerful God is, to notice just how fantastic creation is. And if you want to do this, one way to remind yourself of this is one night, instead of watching TV, go outside, make sure all the lights are off around your house, and just look up at the starry sky, look up at the moon, and be reminded of just how vast the universe is, how amazing is God's handiwork, that he placed each of those stars in the, in the sky, in the universe. It's a way to remind ourselves uh, just how big God is and just how powerful God is. Now, when Job, uh, when Job hears this from God, he has a response. And, and let's hear it in uh, Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Again, we have a, a few words of dialogue from God and then Job's response. So hear this, Job 40, 1 through 5. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord. And so Job says, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice but I will say no more. So God speaks, and what's Job's response? It's this. Really, Job is speechless. Wouldn't you be speechless too if God spoke directly to you? I know I would be. Especially if this voice came out of a whirlwind and said, Keith, I just heard you complaining. Um, I want you to know I hear everything. I've heard every word of complaint you've ever lodged against me. And I've heard every question you've had about what I'm doing. But now I'm going to demand that you make these complaints and ask these questions directly to my face. So go ahead. 
I would be like this. I would be thinking, oh my, I should have never complained. I should have never opened my mouth. The Lord is right before me asking for me to, uh, to say these things directly to his face. You know, I'd be thinking, who am I to question God? Who am I to complain about what God does or doesn't do? Um, I am, it's not my job to figure all this out. It's not my job to understand why God does what he does or why God doesn't do what he does or doesn't do. It's a reminder that God's power and authority over me, over all creation, really puts me in a certain place, and that is in a subordinate position. You know, when I think about my own self-importance, about my own preferences, and about my own ability to do things, I need to recognize that in contrast to what God is, I am not very much. My self-importance is reduced, and that's a healthy thing for us to recognize that sometimes we think we're just a little too big for our britches. In this experience, maybe instead of saying, woe is me all the time, we might be saying, whoa, God is great. God is amazing. Oh, praise the Lord for who he is for who powerful he is. You know, it really helps me to realize this perspective, helps me to realize I don't deserve the blessings I've received. I don't deserve life itself in the first place. I didn't make myself, the Lord made me. And I certainly don't deserve forgiveness for my rebellion against the Lord, but God gives them anyway. Do you wanna know who the only person that deserves anything? is who that person is it's the lord only the lord deserves anything and what he deserves is our praise our worship he deserves to be glorified because he created us all he is aware of everything and 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 is in control of everything and his power and authority reign supreme in the entire universe You know, sometimes we just are too in love with our own abilities, our own skills, our own resourcefulness, and uh, we just pat ourselves on the back and, and just tell ourselves we're, we're good, we're, we've, we've done good. You know, the reality is we need to recognize that all those resources come from the Lord. Everything we have comes from the Lord. We could do nothing without Him. And we need not make the mistake of worshiping his gifts instead of worshiping him. He is the one who is behind it all. Now, I mentioned earlier about Jesus being our mediator, and, and maybe because of his gentleness in his earthly ministry, we might be overly casual with the Lord. You know, we do know that the Lord loves us and that Jesus is our mediator to this day, at this very moment, he sits at the right hand of the Father, intercessing on our behalf and lifting our concerns before him, making our petitions uh, before the Lord, before, the God, before God. But we must never forget that Jesus will be coming back. He'll be coming back soon. And when he does, he's not going to come gentle like a shepherd shepherding his sheep. He certainly won't come like a sacrificial lamb. Instead, when he comes again, he's going to come as a fiery warrior. Uh, we hear about this in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, where he's described as being on a white horse, and with justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe that's dripping with blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads 
the winepress of the fury of the wrath of, the, of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, that's from Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. This is the picture of Christ returning. You know, right now, he is our intercessor. He is our mediator. He is our brother, in fact. But we need to strike a balance in our relationship with him and our relationship with the Father. Jesus is not just there to give us comfort and joy, although that's one of the things he gives us. And clearly, through Jesus, God declares his love for us. But we can't become complacent. We need not treat God casually. We need to come before him, never forgetting how mighty and awesome he is, how worthy of respect and obedience he is. And when we come before him, we need to approach with expectation and also humility. So, again, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I don't know in what way you came to church this morning, in what mode, in what frame of mind about God, but let us be reminded, our Lord is powerful, he is mighty, and when we hear his voice and consider his creation, one of our responses ought to be, that is awesome, God. I am in awe of you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, please continue to speak to us and reveal yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, that that we have been reminded, perhaps even shocked and prodded into being reminded that you are awesome, Lord, that you are powerful, that you created all that exists, and that you are the ultimate authority over everything. Lord, please have your way in us and through us. Lord, continue to shock and surprise us. Continue to impress us with your power. You are mighty, you are glorious, and you deserve our worship and praise. We thank you, God, for these reminders. We thank you, Lord, for your patience and your love. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Uh, your church family loves you. And God loves you most of all. God bless. Bye-bye.